This morning I wanted to speak on uh, this verse here, the Lord knows his own. Does anyone know why I put a picture of a sheep? Uh, Turn with me to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me so that you can be familiar with these verses. It says in John chapter 10, verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my, my own know me. I know my own. All my sheep, my sheep, I know them. And also, my sheep know me. There's a familiarity that God wants to have with his sheep. With each of us, he wants to have a familiarity with us. Not only that we know him, but he also knows me. And I wanted to speak on something that I see that the Lord gives us a vision into the future. In his word, he tells us what the future is going to be like. He knows what's going to happen on that final day. And so he tells us in advance what we must do so that we may be prepared for that day. This last week, they said, there's going to be a storm that's coming in. Many of you are going to be affected by this storm. Many of you may run out of power. Many of you may be cold. And when it says many of you are going to be affected, what should we do? If we know that many of us are going to be affected, we would prepare for that day so that when the storm comes, we have enough food, we have enough warm clothes, we're going to be ready for that day. And when the Lord speaks about the final day when we stand before him, one thing he constantly says, many people will not be ready on that day. And so if I hear that many are not going to be ready on that day, I want to prepare so that I take heed to the Lord's warning today so that I would not be found among those many people. Turn with me to Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, Jesus spoke this parable, and he said this, Matthew 25, that this is how it's going to be on that final day. Verse 1, then the kingdom of heaven will be compared to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five of them were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil in the flasks. Now when the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all the virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Verse 11. Later, the other virgins, the foolish virgins, also came. Lord, Lord, open for us. Verse 12. But he answered, I do not know you. Verse 13, be on the alert for you do not know the the day nor the hour. All of these ten virgins were waiting for the bridegroom. They knew the bridegroom was coming. They were getting ready to meet them, meet him. They all had a lamp which was burning. 
But when they came to the door and they were knocking the five virgins who did not have oil in the flask, what did Jesus say? I do not know you. When I used to read this verse, and I don't know if you have read it this way as well, this is how I used to read it. But he answered, truly I say to you, you did not know me. Does it say that? That I did not know God? Or does it say that God did not know me? It says God did not know me. It didn't say that I didn't know him. These virgins knew the bridegroom. They were going to meet him. But when they got to the door, they found out that the bridegroom did not know them. And if the Lord says, on the final day, there's going to be five virgins that were ready and five virgins that were not ready, then I say, Lord, 50% of the people are not going to be ready. Lord, am I one of those in the 50% who's not ready, Lord? If I'm not ready, guess when is the best time to be ready? When is the best time to be ready? Today, right now, is the best time to be ready. Five of the virgins had a flask of oil. Other five virgins did not have a flask of oil. And when I see the difference between the two groups of virgins, ones who are ready and ones who weren't, the ones who are ready said, Lord, yes, Lord, we know you, but we also want you to know us. Lord, we want to open up this flask, Lord. Open it up. Lord, you pour out. You pour into this flask of oil. The oil was always a picture of the Holy Spirit. Lord, let your Holy Spirit, Lord, fill me, Lord. I want you to fill every part of me, Lord. I want you to know me, every part of me, Lord. My ambitions, my decisions, every part of me, I want you to know. That's what the five virgins said. Lord, I want you to know me. And the Lord opened the door for those five virgins. But for the ones who said, Lord, no, I, I want to know you, but I don't want you to know me. There's many areas of my life that I don't want you to come into. Turn with me to Luke 14, uh, Luke, I'm sorry, Luke 13. Luke chapter 13, verse 23. Luke 13, 23. And someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are going to be saved? And he said to them, strive to enter the narrow door for many, I tell you, will seek to enter in and will not be able to. Verse 26, once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door and you begin and stand outside and knock on the door, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Verse 26, this is what many people are going to be saying on that day. We ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. We heard your teaching. We went and spent time with your people. We ate and drank. Many of the people are going to say this. And he will say again, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. These are people, I, I can say, Lord, like the virgins, I want to go and meet you. I know you as my bridegroom. Like these people in Luke 13, I can say, Lord, I've eaten and drank with your people. I've heard you speak. Can it be said of me that the Lord says, Ajay, yes, 
You've gone to meetings. You've been with God's people. You were saying that you wanted to know me. But Ajay, you never opened the door to let me come in and know you. Verse Matthew 7, 21. Turn with me. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does, does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Verse 22. Again, the word many. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Verse 23, and he, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me who practice lawlessness. And you see this. Those who did not let the Lord know them, there was something that also came along with it. It says, depart from me who practice lawlessness, evildoers. They were living in sin. They were living in sin, and they did not let the Lord know them. They didn't want the Lord to come into their lives, to search them. And so when I hear this, I say, Lord, today I hear your voice, Lord. I want to respond, Lord. I say, Lord, you search me, Lord. It's a beautiful verse in Psalm 139. Each one of us can take this this morning and say this to the Lord. Each one of you say it to the Lord. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Lord, yes, Lord, I want to know you, but Lord, I want you to know me. Search my heart, Lord. Search me, Lord. Come into every room of my heart, Lord. I don't want a single room of my heart to be close to you. You come and know it, know me, Lord. Try me. Know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any hurtful way in me. And lead me in the everlasting way. Lord, see if there's anything, Lord, that makes you sad. And so if I want to know for sure that the Lord knows me, there's a beautiful promise in Hebrews 12 where God says, these are the people that I consider my children and these are the people I don't consider my children. And if, if you want a birth certificate, you know, a birth certificate from God that God knows me, this is a verse you can see. Verse 7 it is for discipline that you endure. If you en endure discipline, if God is allowed to allow, if I allow God to discipline me, God to show me in my life when He sees something that's wrong, then God deals with you as with sons or daughters. Then God has given me a birth certificate. Ajay? Yes, when I correct you, you receive it. And that's a proof that I consider you as my son. This is my birth certificate for you. Yes, I know you. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? If you are without discipline, you are not my son. So this is one evidence to see, Lord, am I your child? Do you know me? And we talk about discipline. I say, Lord, how easy is it for you to discipline me? When you say a word of correction, how easy is it for you? Is it, is it something that you find difficult? Because you know that if you correct me in something... I'm going to get offended or I'm going to make an excuse or I'm going to blame somebody else. I make it so difficult for you to correct me that the next time 
you find something wrong in my life that you're hesitant to come and correct me? It's a good question. I, I want to ask the Lord this morning. You can ask as well. Lord, how easy is it for you when you find something wrong in me to correct me? Is it very hard? Or do you find it easy because I'm so receptive to what you have to say? I love this verse in Mark 14. Turn with me to Mark 14. There is one thing that Peter did. The Lord found freedom in correcting him. When he saw Peter going and preventing Jesus from going to the cross, he was able to correct him so severely and said, get behind me, Satan. Jesus had such freedom to correct Peter because he knew Peter would receive it. Read with me here. In, uh, it says here in Mark 14, verse 34, or 33, you can, say, you can read with me. And he took Peter, James and John, the three of them, and being very distressed and troubled, he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. Verse 35, and he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray. If it were possible, the hour may pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Verse 37, and he came and found them sleeping. That means he found James sleeping, he found John sleeping, and he found Peter sleeping. But when he wanted to correct them, look at what he says. He found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for an hour, one hour? Wasn't three of them sleeping? Wasn't James also sleeping? Wasn't John also sleeping? Why did Jesus only correct Peter? I feel that the Lord had such freedom to correct Peter because he knew that if he corrected Peter, that he was not going to give an explanation. He was not going to say, why, what about them? He had such freedom. And I say, Lord, do you have the same freedom with me? If you find something to correct me about, will you correct me? When we read about Judas Iscariot, he was secretly taking money from the money box. But we never read of Jesus ever correcting Judas till the very end when he says, why do you bother this woman? And immediately he got offended. So the Lord knew that if I correct Judas, he's going to get offended. So when he saw something wrong in Judas, he never corrected him. Judas could say, Jesus, I know you. I walked with you for three and a half years. But Jesus, Judas could not say, Lord, you know everything about me. You have the freedom to correct me. You have the freedom to say something is wrong in my life. There's a verse in Zephaniah. When you think about correcting those who are proud and you say, brother or sister, seek to be humble, you would think that that exhortation should be for a proud person. But it says in Zephaniah, and I love this verse in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3. Who does the Lord ask to seek humility? It says here in verse 3, Seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth, who have carried out his ordinances. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. The Lord asks the humble people to go and seek more humility. In the, light, the same way, when I think of correction, what do you think about correction? Oh yeah, this person's making a mistake. This person's going astray. He needs to be corrected, right? 
But turn with me to John chapter 15. Yes, the Lord corrects us when we're going astray, but see in John chapter 15, verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And listen to this. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. Or you can say he cuts it. Or you can say he disciplines it. Which, which branch does he discipline? It's the one which is already bearing fruit. Many times when we think of correction, we think, oh, I did something wrong. No. It could be that we're bearing fruit, and the Lord has hope for us that we can bear even more fruit. And that's why he has confidence to correct me. We must see the, the heart of God even in his correction. Or else we will say, Lord, I don't want you to correct me. I don't want you to speak into my life. If we see that correction, the Lord corrects those, those he, whom he loves, but he also corrects those who he sees as bearing fruit, and he says that they may bear more fruit. So if the Lord is correcting you or me, that shows me that he has confidence in me or you, that we may bear more fruit if we yield to his correction and his pruning. It is very true that the Lord has not dealt with us according to what we deserve. If the Lord were to take every one of my sins and deal with me according to all my failures, mistakes, it would be a, a terrible thing. And I thank the Lord in his mercy and his tenderness that he's corrected me. But even in his correction and discipline, he's done it very tenderly. Turn with me to Psalm 103, verse 10. We must remember these promises. And think of your own lives, the number of times you failed the Lord, even after coming to know him. How has the Lord been with you? How many things has he covered up? Like it says, he, covering up a multitude of sins. How many sins has the Lord covered up? Psalm 103, verse 10. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities or sins. He's not rewarded us to the full extent of what we deserve. He's been very kind to us and merciful to us. So many things he's covered up and he's cleansed in his precious blood. I have a question, a couple of questions for you. And you can shout out the answer. Which disciple said he needs to see the wounds of Jesus to believe that he is He's risen from the dead. Do you know which disciple? It was Thomas. Very good. Which disciple cut off the high priest's servant's ear? Very good. It was Peter. Third question. Which disciple said he was going fishing after Jesus rose from the dead? It actually started with Peter, and then the others said, okay, we'll come. For, uh, a couple of others also said they'll come along, but it started with Peter. I think you thought I was going to ask a different disciple. So, uh, But if you knew the answer to all three of these questions, the reason you knew the answer to these questions is because you read the Gospel of John. All the other three Gospels do not mention the names of these disciples, and these, some of them don't even mention the incident. And when I think about God's correction, when he corrected Peter, he did write down his failures, right? When Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, it's written in Matthew 16. It's written down. 
when he denied the Lord. It's written in Matthew. It's written in Mark when he denied the Lord, right? It wrote there and said Peter. But when it said about him cutting off the ears of the, disciple, uh, of, of the ser- high priest's servant, it says, and one of them cut off the high priest's servants in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It doesn't name that it was Peter. Do you know why? The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written around the time when the disciples were there. All the people who were living in that time could read Mark, Matthew, and and Luke. And they would have seen all of Peter's failures, all of the other disciples' failures, all of the sins that they had committed. And I believe God in his mercy and compassion said, Matthew, I don't want you to write this. Just put, it was one of the disciples. Let them know that the high priest's servant's ear was cut off. But don't tell them who did it. And I believe the reason the Lord wanted it that way was he wanted to preserve Peter's. I believe he already felt very discouraged by denying the Lord and all the other areas where he had failed. And adding this one more thing, where he had cut off the ear, where he could have actually killed, right? If you cut off the ear, that was so close. He probably could have killed the high priest servants. And I believe he would have had such regret. Lord, I nearly killed a man. And if it was not for your mercy, I would have had to live with regret that I killed a servant throughout my life. And I believe that the Lord in his mercy said, Matthew, Mark, Luke, I don't want you to write this. But John, I believe that this is going to help others in the future. So I want you to write it. The Gospel of John was written about 85 AD, about 50 years after Jesus died and rose again. 50 years later, When you read the Gospel of John, Peter is not alive anymore. He was martyred about 67 or 68 AD. Thomas was martyred about 70 AD in India, in Chennai. When John was writing all of these things, the people he wrote about, most of them were not alive at the time, especially these apostles whom he wrote about their failures. And that's where I see God's great kindness, even in his discipline. He has not dealt with us according to what we deserve. God's love is so gracious, even in his correction. He's so sensitive and tender that he does not want to ashamed. The woman at the well, the man at Bethesda, which he healed, all of those people, most likely they were not alive when he wrote there. So when you read the Gospel of John from now on, as you read of it, remember that God wrote about these things after that they were... So then, if God is so loving, even in his correction, and him knowing me, and showing me my unchristlikeness. Why do I hide from the Lord? Why do I want to close this flask and say, Lord, don't fill this oil, Lord. I want some areas of my life where I cover up and say, Lord, I don't want you to come and fill every part of it. Why? Why do we hide? Correction is not joyful. If anyone says correction is joyful, they're not being honest. Because God's word itself, turn with me to Hebrews 12. When Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, to Peter, I don't think it was joyful. I believe it was very, very sorrowful. 
he would have been shocked. It says here in verse 11, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields peaceful fruit of righteousness. After they yield to the pruning, they bear much fruit. Yes, sometimes we have to go and uh, get a shot. It's not, it's, it's painful when it goes in, but it's for our good. What's the other reasons that I would hide from the Lord when the Lord corrects me or he wants to show me? It's like in the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, what, what did they do? Immediately they went in, they went and hid. It says they went behind the trees in the garden to hide from God. Why? Because they had failed, they had done something wrong. And it says, there it says in John chapter 3 verse 19, you can turn with me, John chapter 3 verse 19. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness more than the light. For their deeds were evil. Verse 20, for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Why don't I come to the light? It's because when God shines his light in my heart, I'm scared to see what he's going to see. There's something in my life that I don't want him to see. And so that's why I hide in the darkness. But it goes on to say, but he who practices the right uh, truth, he's honest. Yes, Lord, I failed. Yes, Lord, I sinned. What does he do? He comes to the light so that his deeds might be manifested, having been wrought with, in God. So there's two kinds of people. One, when they see the light, they run away because they're scared that God's going to see something that they don't want him to see. And the others, they come to the light saying, Lord, yes, Lord, I've made a mistake, but I want to be honest. You know it. I can't hide behind the trees. You already know I failed, Lord. I want to be honest. Today, the Lord has the light, and it's shining. He's come into the world as the light of the world. And as that light comes, you have two choices, one to hide or one to come into the light. And say, Lord, yes, Lord. It says about Judas, turn with me to John, uh, John 12, verse 6. Now he said this, meaning Judas said this, not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he put, and as he had the money box, he used to take some of it, pilfer, that means take some of it, what was put in it. And so when nobody was looking, what did, what did Judas do with the money? He went in, took it. Do you think he would have felt comfortable if Jesus were to walk in when, just as he was taking that money? Do you think he would have felt comfortable? You say, Lord, Lord, come in. You can come and see every part of my life and what I'm doing in secret. No. He would have found a time when the Lord said, oh, I'm going to go here. And then he would have gone secretly and took the money. The first time he took it, I believe it would have convicted him so much. Judas, what you're doing is wrong. The second time it would have got easier. Finally, he would have came to a place where he could take money and his conscience would have not even bothered him, even if he knew that the Lord was there. It says that there's two sides to this coin. 
when we talk about God knowing us, there's another side to this. Today when I see each one of you, I see you with the candle. I see the light shining here, each one of you. The thing that I don't see, and you don't see in me, is whether you have opened up the flask that you have to the Lord. I don't know that. That happens in secret, whether you've opened the flask to let the Lord in, to know you, when he corrects you. I don't know how you handle correction in your private life. I don't know. The Lord knows. You don't know how I, how I am in my private life. You see me with my light today on Sunday. I see your light here on Sunday. But when the Lord comes, he's not going to ask who has a candle. He's not going to ask who has the lamp. He's going to ask who's having the flask of oil. If I'm content with all of you seeing my candle today, my lamp today, and I'm not interested in what God sees, I'm almost guaranteed that I won't be ready when the Lord comes because I was only interested in what you all see on Sunday, but I was not interested in what God sees all the time, which is in private. And if there's one thing that we must all take seriously and take to heart this morning is remember on that day, the one thing that will matter is what was inside that flask, whether we open the flask to the Lord to have his way in us, to know us fully, or whether we covered it up. What we did in public will not matter on that day. Turn with me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. There's two sides to this coin. And one side, which is the God side of the coin, which God only can see, Nevertheless, nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal, or you can say having this coin. On one side it says, the Lord knows those who are his. So this morning, the Lord knows who are his, who have opened up their flask of oil. He knows who are his. If you turn that coin to the other side, what is our part? Read with me the rest of it. Everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain or to depart from wickedness. So the Lord knows who are his. How will I know on my side if I'm his or not? If I'm his, I'll let the Lord come to every part of my life and I'll depart from iniquity. There's something, you can't say the Lord knows me and I'm living in sin. The two can't stay together. Either I'm departing from sin and I let the Lord to know me or I'm living in sin and I don't let the Lord into my life to know me. It's one or the other, a desire for sin. And this is a verse I, I think we can all remember today. You will never forget this verse, I believe. It's Psalm 24-7, meaning this is what we should do 24 hours a day and seven days a week. Psalm 24-7. Oh, ancient doors, Oh, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. This morning, every single one of us has this opportunity never to forget 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 
Lord, I want to open the door of my heart, Lord. You come into any part of my life. You tell me if there's anything that's displeasing to you, and I'll change it, Lord. If there's some wrong attitude, if there's some wrong motive, if there's something that's wrong in my life that you find in my life, Lord, you come and tell me, Lord. I want my door to be open always, 24-7. Psalm 24-7. Keep the Lord's, the door open always for the Lord. Did you know that Jesus also, in his life, opened the door for his father? We read how he said in the Garden of Gethsemane, Lord, if this cup may pass away, let it pass away, but yet not as I will, but as you will. Father, this is my preference, but I've given, I've opened up my flask, Father, you tell me, do you want me to go? It's your will, Lord. Jesus is our example. Lord, you want me to go to Tyre and Sidon because there's a woman there whose daughter is demon-possessed? I'll go there, Lord. Father, I'll go there. Jesus, I want you to go. There's a man there who is in need of help, whose son is demon-possessed. I want you to go. Will you go? Yes, Lord. Jesus was always sensitive to what the Father wanted him to do. His flask was always open for the Father. You might say, but I've failed the Lord so much. I've made so many mistakes. I feel embarrassed to go to the Lord today and open up my heart. There are two men that we can find encouragement, who had failed tremendously, who opened up their hearts to the Lord in their lives. Turn with me to Luke chapter 23. These are people who have failed greatly, who still found hope that they could open up their hearts to the Lord. It says, verse 39, one of the criminals who was hanging there was hurling abuse at Jesus, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Verse 40, But the other answered and rebuked him and said, Do you not even fear God? Since you are also under the same sentence of condemnation. Verse 44, And indeed we are suffering justly. We deserve this. We lived wickedly all our lives, and we deserve to be crucified. For we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Verse 42. He didn't say, Lord, I'm going to do this for you. Lord, the one thing he said. Lord, not that I know you. Lord, please remember me. Please, you remember me. When you come in your kingdom... Remember me. And to this man who had done nothing but evil all his life, God said this. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. If this man at the end of his life, who had lived for sin all his life, could let the Lord in, in the final moments of his life, that means there is hope for you, and me today. Every single one, from the oldest to the youngest, have hope this morning. Turn with me to Luke 19, a few pages earlier. <clears throat> verse, verse 5. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to, looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry down, Hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house. This was a person that Jesus knew his name. Zacchaeus was not saying Jesus. Jesus was saying Zacchaeus. The Lord knew his name. A man who had failed, who had cheated many people. Another man who had failed all his life. 
Jesus said to him, I want to come and stay in your house. Will you open up your door and let me in? And he says, it says to this man who had failed all his life. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. There shouldn't be a reason for any one of us not to receive the Lord gladly. Even if we've failed miserably, today we can say, Lord, you know, you've seen all my failures. But Lord, thank you, Lord, for giving hope for even one who's failed so much. Come into my life. Open, I open every single door of my life to you. And the final verse as we close in Revelation chapter 3, one of the last words that he says to the church. First he says, verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. Those I love, I reprove and discipline. So the Lord is telling you, if you want this love of mine, remember, it comes with reproof and discipline. And after he says that, this is what he says next. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I'll dine with him and he with me. He tells him, if you let me in, I'm going to discipline you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to correct you. And now he says, I'm going to knock. Will you let me in? This morning, dear brother, sister, young person, friend, we know what the day, the final day is going to look like. More than the Lord asking, do you know me? The Lord's going to ask you whether he knew you. Today is the day of salvation. There's hope for every single one of us. Let us open the door and say, Lord, there's no pit too deep that the love of God cannot reach deeper still. May the Lord help us. Amen.